Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm Marvin Lazarson. I'm going to chair this committee on, um, on rethinking governance and, uh, uh, and curriculum in the age of um, technology. Uh, I, I'm going to dispense with the usual introductions um, in the interest of time and um, simply say that Manfred Laubichler from, the, from Arizona State University will talk first, followed by Guida Caniglia from um, the Fana University Lunenberg, and then ending up with Hannes Kloppa from um, I University uh, in Berlin, and he can tell you what that actually means. So, Manfred, you're on. Yeah. Thanks, Marvin. Uh, and let me thank uh, Livio for uh, inviting me uh, to present here even after listening to me in Tel Aviv. Um, <laughs> because, uh, so uh, I think we are changing uh, course a little bit in the afternoon. We heard a lot of uh, deep thoughts about policies, about history, about how we got to where we are. Uh, and now we are trying to uh, think about where are we going. Uh, with universities, uh, with the problems of universities, with the role of universities uh, in our society. Uh, to do that, let me pose a challenge. And that is sort of the challenge. How can we basically, recognizing all the historical trajectories that we heard about uh, this morning, develop new models of research and education that address the main challenges of the 21st century? Uh, I recently had a conversation uh, with a colleague in complexity science from Singapore and um, we sort of came up with a kind of a Gedanken experiment. Uh, if we would have all the knowledge that we have developed over the millennia available to us, and if there would be no universities, and if we would have to design an institution that would add to this knowledge, but also deliver that knowledge uh, to society, would we end up with the universities that we have? And uh, it's a you know, nice, entertaining thought, because obviously uh, we have to live with the universities that we have, not the ones that we might want to create if there would be a clean slate. But uh, it also raises a, a challenge if the gap between where we might want to be in terms of a university system and the university structure and where we are, can we use that gap to basically develop policies and governance structures to close the gap? So that, I think, is what we are here uh, to discuss. Um, the, if we do that kind of exercise, of course, if we say, what are universities for, uh, then we have to get some clarity about what are the nature of the problems that universities actually are addressing. Clearly, there is uh, research going on, clearly there is education going on, but uh, what kind of research, what kind of education, uh, in what distributed system? So there are many uh, open questions uh, that we need to keep in mind. Uh, one uh, important issue that uh, comes uh, at the top of the list is, of course, one uh, of integration. Uh, we heard before that there is used to be fashionable to talk about interdisciplinarity, uh, which in practice basically became an excuse to create new disciplines. Uh, so let's dispense of that term and talk really about the integration of knowledge that is needed uh, to address problems that have the unfortunate tendency to ignore disciplinary boundaries. Um, and so if you start from the problems, then we need to build an infrastructure uh, that is designed to really address them, and that requires integration. Now, integration, as we will see uh, in a moment, poses a, a whole number of challenges, many of them connected to governance. Because, if anything, our current system of university governance is designed to prevent integration and to sort of ascertain some sort of disciplinary purity of sorts, uh, where it's uh, completely forbidden that somebody uh, from the social sciences might talk to somebody from the natural sciences or the humanities um, and let alone have a say in what should be going on in their respective disciplines. Uh, Gavi already sort of mentioned the challenge 
uh, or the long-term role of universities to educate the leaders of the future, uh, the question, of course, is that enough? Particularly if we are thinking in terms of democratic societies. Uh, because we can have uh, educated leaders, but if the people have other beliefs, that then that doesn't matter. So we just, uh, in a democratic society, don't have to just educate the leaders, we also have to educate the electorate, if we believe in democracy. Uh, so those are some of the challenges that we face, and a lot of them uh, clearly uh, have to do with governance. Now, um, this is just a headline that sums it all up. Uh, this is the current situation. Uh, this is about American schools, universities. You can sort of substitute American with everything else. Basically, we are training people for a world that doesn't exist. And if the main role for uh, 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 many departments is to basically clone themselves, uh, then that world also doesn't exist because uh, 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 science and researchers uh, moving at a fast pace and to be trained in what has been does not prepare you in what is about to come. Now, why does that matter uh, outside of the universities? Because if we don't address this within the universities, we will be run out of business. And the answer to this is a following advertisement here. Employers are basically, uh, well, increasingly are saying universities are useless. What uh, they need are what they call now nano degrees, rapidly changing credentials uh, in skills uh, for people in the marketplace. That's one uh, issue, and I think uh, uh, Hannes will be talking about some developments uh, in that domain. Um, nano degrees is one area, but it's, it goes further. Microsoft has now, and not alone Microsoft, has now very concrete plans uh, to build its own university because they are not getting the graduates from the universities that they need. So companies are taking notice and say what the universities are doing is completely irrelevant from what we need. Now, do we want this world where big corporations that uh, run policy and politics on a large scale already are also running the education and research enterprise? Because certainly they have the means to do that if they put their mind to it and we can sit here in comfortable settings and ponder what needs to be done, but if we don't watch it, uh, this is going to happen. So what we need is uh, what uh, basically, um, uh, it's a picture with a line from a uh, policy piece in science about a year ago, uh, we need a major reconfiguration of the entire system. The question is how we're going to do that, and uh, uh, what are the principles uh, that guide us in that process. So uh, this uh, uh, was part of the discussion that uh, we had uh, in that year-long group that uh, Yehuda was uh, convening when we were all at the Wissenschaftskolleg in 2009 and 10. So we came up with some very general principles that sound very good. And we wrote a manifesto, because that's what you do in Berlin. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> But we, what I'm here to report is how we actually try to implement uh, that uh, manifesto and what lessons we learned in various uh, places. And Guido will expand more on one particular experiment, but also what impediments, now speaking as somebody who actually had to run and build those structures to implement that uh, curriculum reform manifesto. What are the policy and governance in impediments and challenges that we face? So the impediments uh, roughly uh, fall in three categories. One I briefly mentioned, uh, and that is that the problems that we face, and that was sort of the first uh, premise of the curriculum reform manifesto, that all the interesting questions and relevant problems for society are complex problems that do not map onto what you can call disciplinary purity. So there you have a major intellectual but also governance issue within the academic enterprise. What is it that we need? What new science do we need? But also how do we organize knowledge and different dimensions of knowledge differently that it's reflective of the actual problems? The second is a big issue.
for governance and also for the kind of institutions that we need. And that's also why we have this uh, session here on uh, new technologies and digital technologies. It has to do with scalability. Uh, we implemented uh, the Curriculum Reform Manifesto, I think, quite successfully in an experiment that over four years taught 80 students. Uh, that was a good proof of principle, but the challenge is how can you scale this up? And we need to scale this up, so that's a huge problem. Um, and the, set, the third issue here, um, uh, I think the German term captures it that much nicer than the English one, um, parochial politics. Because what it does, and what uh, Yehuda was really insisting very much that needs to happen, is networks of collaborations. That needs, requires that institutions learn how to play with each other. And universities are particularly bad at this. So, because they're also resistant to change. So we can actually ask what's going on with universities. And it's interesting to look at how CEU works with those challenges, because what is preventing uh, new models uh, uh, within universities. There are a couple of forces. We have already heard a lot about the coercive nature of bureaucracies in universities that sort of keep things the same. Of course, if you start something new, it's always easier to imitate what's already there. And we see a lot of that and a lot of challenges whether now uh, the, uh, a certain part of the American model should become the standard uh, in Europe. Uh, so the Germans have an obsession with excellence because they sort of figure out we need to clone or find a Harvard in Germany, which is of course complete nonsense. But it's uh, a lot of those things are going on. Uh, so there's a normative culture, mimetic simplicity, coercive bureaucracy that basically keep new things from emerging in the, in the system at large. Which is a problem because, as uh, as Gabi pointed out, for the humanities, but that's generally true for the university system at large. It was designed to educate a very small percentage of the population, and it works very well for that. But the problem that we have today has to do with uh, also the imperative of innovation. So this is a projection. This is for the U.S. Um, so this patchwork of fields that represents the degrees. Uh, and the various fields. So the greenish stuff is the current national degree production of the United States. If you just factor in population growth, we need to get to the yellow one. However, economists and many policy people tell us in order to basically keep the uh, US economy on track and competitive, by 2030, we need to have what uh, the Texans called the 60-30 goal. We need to have a, a penetration rate of tertiary education, 60% of the population, which requires us to educate that many people. How is the current system going to do that? The answer is it can't, unless it uh, uh, sort of severely changes. So let's sort of look at some uh, brief historical steps about, and this is now for the US, uh, uh, but you could do similar um, scenarios for uh, other places, for Europe, for instance, how this system actually went about and what the challenges are. So in the 17th century, with Harvard, Princeton, and others being established in the US, you had a model that was on-campus instruction, uh, full immersion, at a very high cost, uh, at a very low scale. It worked perfectly in that context. It was designed, in a way, for the 17th and 18th century, uh, where the aristocratic elite and basically the uh, priest class went to college and got some education. Uh, the next step, uh, then, uh, was a kind of a scaling up issue uh, uh, right around the period of the American uh, Revolution, where uh, the system began to grow uh, the grow, uh, you basically got the first sort of state universities in the uh, modern sense, again, full immersion, uh, slightly lower cost. They figured out how to lower the cost and slight increase in scale. Uh, the next level then, uh, uh, again, sort of in a roughly 100 year interval, uh, with the establishment of the University of California system, many of the Western university systems, 
keeping the third immersion model, keeping the cost at medium scale, increasing the scale. Uh, that was basically the emergence uh, of the modern American university in a gradual fashion. Then they, they got a dose of Germany uh, and basically invented Johns Hopkins, University of Chicago, so that's the model of the research universities, which came at a price. Let, kept the full immersion, medium scale, reduced the number of people that any one of those institutions could handle as opposed to, let's say, a University of Wisconsin and others, but dramatically increased the cost of the system. So that's, that's the emergence of a very expensive way of educating uh, many uh, of uh, the American students. Now, um, our university and our president has championed uh, what he calls the new American university model. And uh, what it really is is still uh, up for debate. It continues to uh, develop. But um, you see some of the issues here, what we're trying to face at. So, at, for the first time, a change in the way education is delivered as a combination of full immersion on campus enhanced by digital technologies, uh, which allows to keep the cost not low, but at least in the medium range, uh, but it is scalable. And uh, the scale that we are operating here is right now, uh, ASU is the largest university in the United States with about roughly 85,000 on-campus students and uh, currently about 30,000 online-only students. And the online part is a rapidly growing development. So there's the scale issue that's being addressed. So what comes with that? Well, uh, hold on, wrong direction. Um, so we have been called the number one innovative university by whatever institution who does those kind of rankings. But uh, we are also realizing that this growth model has one particular uh, issue. It focuses still on single institutions. And that's what the main challenge is because that's not scalable in the long run. So beyond phase five means we have to create networks for research and education. And that brings in itself uh, a whole set of additional uh, governance issues. So we are currently running two experiments, well, several others, but those are the ones I run, so I know something about them. One has to do with our relationship with Leuphana University in Germany, and Guido will talk about that. And the second one is our relationship with the Santa Fe Institute, which is a private research institute. Um, but we are currently developing an online master's degree in complexity science with the challenges of how can you integrate the expertise from a non-university into a university setting because if the private institute can't offer degrees, the university can. The private institute has a lot of expertise that is distributed across a network of 150 researchers worldwide. Uh, getting them all to agree to play within one institution or setting to advance a degree that actually makes sense uh, includes a lot of challenges. So what are those challenges? So uh, roughly they fall into a few categories. Between institutions, uh, we need to basically uh, figure out how can we align uh, values and funding, which is sort of the easy part, but then in the current marketplace of institutions, everybody is very protective of their branding. So if you try to actually create what everybody uh, admits to is the only way we can make progress is that universities start to cooperate, how does that work? Uh, how can we overcome the individualized branding strategies, uh, which is, brings us back to what we call Kirchturmpolitik, because everybody just looks at their own church table. Um, so how can we move from competition to cooperation? And we have to, because if we c keep in, uh, playing in the competitive world, universities will lose out against Google, Amazon, and Microsoft because they are dissatisfied with what universities do and they are willing to change the game. And then we have a different situation. Um, and then we have I mean, uh, the situation, what, what, what Rivka sort of pointed out in the case of Israel, so there is a consensus historically emerging about the role of institutions, 
But if Google and Amazon offer a cheaper solution, how likely is it that a government will say, well, we just take that because our academics don't know what they're doing anyway, so let's just you know, not hire them again. So this is the world we are living in. So that's between institutions. Within institutions, we have um, even more problematic challenges, and some of them have to do with what Modi was saying earlier. Again, the funding models of most universities, how funds are distributed between departments are a big mess and contribute to a lot of problems. But also, it has to do with control over degrees, appointments, and tenure. Because if we want to bring in into uh, academics, that means educational principles, experts from the outside that are not vetted by uh, faculty-driven committees, but that have important areas of expertise, how are we doing that? What are the gov uh, governance principles that actually are needed to make that happen? Actually, business schools and medical schools are further ahead with this. Uh, but so we need to actually find models for this. And then there is a big problem uh, with all of that, and it came up several times uh, in discussions. Uh, in our internal discussions, we called it the problem of institutional entropy. Because if you try to establish new things within a university setting, you have to put a lot of energy in the system. Because if you don't do it, the system uh, behaves like any physical system. It finds its position of lowest entropy, which is basically business as usual. And so uh, how can you facilitate uh, to put that energy into the system? I mean, I have a ranking of conservative institutions. Institution number three is the Vatican. Institution number two are universities. And the most hopeless institutions are medical schools. But that's uh, just a statement here. Statement of fact, actually. Uh, so, uh, but uh, a, a major problem uh, in the context of institutional entropy has to do with the separation between doers and deciders. And that is what, uh, over lunch, we uh, discussed is the problem of the, the rise of the administrative university, where you get layers of unnecessary and ridiculous and stupid bureaucracy embedded in I don't know how many deans uh, that are basically a species that should be fought by all means. Um, and, uh, but they are the ones who, uh, at many points, uh, sit at the decision points but they are not necessarily the most enlightened uh, human beings vis-a-vis -vis, uh, institutional reforms. So how can we actually close that decision gap? And something that deems truly a poor, if we actually want to do all of this, and if we try uh, to create uh, space for collaboration in research and education on a global scale, uh, there needs to be space for experiments and failure. I think that was always what uh, Yehuda encouraged us to do. He always said, you know, I have to be ready to make a fool out of yourself, otherwise you're doing something wrong. Um, but that's not really easy to do in this, this decision structure within the university. So we have a governance issue uh, right there. And finally, and this is sort of the last slide, um, how can we basically overcome, if we enter that really important space, of cross-national and cross-cultural cooperation, we need to figure out how to deal with those challenges. And um, many of those questions uh, uh, Guido will be talking about in the context of the experiment that we ran between ASU and, and Leuphana, and so you get some lessons learned for that. And uh, with this, I'm sort of setting it up for Guido to talk about the global classroom experiment. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, um, Guido, what do you need? I don't know where my presentation is. I sent to the presentation. Yeah, so the so then you need yeah, this.
your words, yes. First of all, thank you very much to CEU for inviting uh, me to present here uh, our project, the Global Classroom. Uh, and uh, thank you for, for being here and listening to us in this uh, hot uh, and post-lunch uh, afternoon. The questions that, that I'm going to address, as uh, referred to by Manfred before, is uh, what could higher education look like in the 21st century? And I'm going to talk about it within the context of one, not a thought experiment, a real experiment in curriculum reform uh, that uh, happened, took place in the last four years. And this project is uh, the Global Classroom Project. The Global Classroom uh, came out of the manifesto that uh, Manfred mentioned and uh, is one of the more concrete legacies, I would say, of uh, Yehuda Iskanan as well. And the Global Classroom is a partnership between Arizona State University and uh, Loifana University, uh, funded by Stiftung Mercator, and uh, to which about 15 instructors, 70 students, four institutes, and the two university participated. The main goal of the global classroom was, from the beginning, to create a model curriculum for change agents in the 21st century. When we talk here about change agents, uh, we refer to what uh, Elkana, for instance, called uh, concerned citizens, and to what this morning had been defined as critical participants in a society. And this can refer to those leaders, again, of the society, but also to many other uh, citizens who are uh, in very different situations and in very different contexts engage uh, in the society we live in. In this project, we designed and implemented this curriculum, and we evaluated and provided in, uh, evidence that it actually works. When thinking about change agents, we situate uh, ourselves within the context of sustainability science. Sustainability science dealing with challenges such as climate change, lack of and loss of biodiversity, uh, fast urbanization processes. And um, this is the kind of challenges that these change agents should be able to address, somehow understand, and start providing solutions to. The curriculum. This is the way we ended up visualizing and conceptualizing this curriculum uh, for the 21st century. In the middle, you see really the curriculum in its three main dimensions of acting, knowing, and being. The bubbles around this uh, triangle represent a, an abstracted version of this world of the 21st century, where you see global, real, local, and virtual intersecting in ways that are not always clear or linear. This is why the intersection of the colors don't really uh, are, are not really predictable from what the circles intersecting uh, would uh, make us think. What I will do in the rest of this presentation is to first talk to you something more, some, s telling you something more about the triangle, so the curriculum, and then more about this context of how this curriculum is placed within the world as we conceive it in this 21st century. The curriculum. So following Elkana, the curriculum domain, it's, it is the core domain of the university. So basically, there's no university without curriculum. We can talk about many things. We can talk about governance. We can talk about institutions. We can talk about people. If the university doesn't have the curriculum and we are thinking about other things, we basically don't have anything. How the curriculum um, is embodied in programs becomes an intentional imaging of order and ordering of educational experiences. Mm? So from the core domain to the program to the kind of um, experience that the students have in the curriculum, which is this holistic process of engagement with rather than acquiring of skills, knowledge, attitudes, and values. So this is the broad idea of the curriculum that we 
uh, started from and somehow ended up with at the same point, at the same time. In the process of thinking, okay, what kind of curriculum do we actually need in the century for these change agents that I was talking to you about? Of course, the first question is knowledge. So what do we want these students to know and what kind of knowledges do we want these students to engage with? And here, of course, also a legacy of Elkana, the understanding of the complex systems that characterize our society and the problems in it is at the first, um, it's, it's on the foreground. Complex systems means also being able to understand from very different disciplines how these systems work and how these problems work. But also not limiting ourselves to thinking about how do we acquire knowledge, but in the, co in the context of a debate that also this morning emerged, how do we make sure students become productors of knowledge? How do we make sure that the research and the learning are not totally disconnected in this context? Second question, acting. What kind of skills do we think students or graduates or citizens should possess in this world. And here you see, for instance, an example of our students in an international collaboration, which you will see virtually mediated, engaging with kids in the community of a very disadvantaged neighborhood in Phoenix, uh, Arizona. So collaborative skills, which also this morning this thing came up, collaboration or not collaboration, Collaborative skills are definitely very important to, for a kind of education in, uh, for change agents or for whoever wants to engage outside of academia in, in the center. And last but not least, being. What kind of mindsets, what kind of attitudes are we actually fostering in uh, the uh, educational systems that we have? Uh, here it's uh, the, the, um, something that was also brought up this morning, uh, positive mindsets, not early cynicals. Uh, this morning, this, um, uh, the idea of these um, critical thinkers who just think that nothing is possible in the world was brought up. And so how we counteract that kind of attitude of the critics and make the critical thinking something that helps participate in the society rather than uh, the opposite. And so this, uh, this early cynical attitude. So acting, knowing, and being are essentially essential to any curriculum are these dimensions that we need to think through and we need to take into account in any kind of program, in any kind of educational experience that we uh, aim to provide. And, but skills, knowledge, and being can be fostered by certain uh, learning experiences, by certain learning areas. And these are the learning areas that are the triangles uh, inside the main triangle of the curriculum. Subject learning, so engaging knowledge and subjects in certain disciplines in certain areas in order to, uh, pre to, to educate, in order to foster, support the education of critical thinkers. Research learning, uh, which means engaging the world with, uh, with our research. Collaborative learning, being able to collaborate across difference, across different social uh, um, fields and, and across different cultures. Professional learning and uh, sense of professional responsibility and personal learning. These learning areas are in the curriculum that we created uh, subject of knowledge, so we teach about what it means to collaborate it, they are also um, allowed to, uh, to, to develop skills, which means the students become able to uh, work in a professional environment as well as in a collaborative learning environment. And all together, we support this reflective attitude that is the being, the Heideggerian in the room who say the Dasein, the, the being in the world somehow, that we want these students to, uh, to possess in this, uh, in our world. Now, if this is the curriculum, the problem is what about the bubbles, okay? So we tend to think about this uh, curriculum and these are somewhat features that do not really uh, depend on the world as we think it, 
but we are dealing with, uh, with very particular challenges in, uh, in uh, for instance, the, the level of sustainability, climate change, and the so-called real world problems. Because these problems are extremely real, which means they affect the poor, they affect the disadvantaged communities, and therefore, they require local action. They, there is a need of university to being able to invest and uh, some, somehow uh, interact with this, with this local context. But acting and thinking locally is, of course, not uh, enough uh, anymore. Because these problems are global and they are not only global in the sense that they uh, concern everybody in, in the globe, but they are global also because they manifest in different ways, in different local contexts, and they also require uh, different actions depending on the local context. So the, the intersection between local and global is really, uh, it's, 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 it's one of the main um, axes of what the curriculum and what these students uh, are supposed to do. Not only global and local, but this, our world, the information age, provides us with a number of tools, of digital and virtual tools, that can help in this process and of uh, implementing this curriculum, so the image uh, in, the, in the very center. And these tools uh, can hopefully also uh, lead towards a more, uh, to the scale up, of scaling up certain experiments, scaling up certain experiences, to broader audiences, to broader, uh, to broader and more uh, diverse context. So, the context, the way this, these bubbles uh, became part of our experiments, are uh, represented somehow by this, the kind of teaching learning environment that we produced and that we experimented on in this, uh, in our global classroom experiment. So, the two locations, students were working in different local contexts and at the same time collaborating with each other. Uh, they worked on issues of urban sustainability, so how climate change affects the two different contexts. But at the same time, they came up with ideas, they we came up with research questions in a collaborative way. This environment was, um, uh, was made possible by the use of uh, virtual technologies and if you can look for instance into our uh, web page to get a better idea of what these virtual tools and technologies are but uh, a very important thing is how to use these tools for local uh, action also for local and collaborative actions to influence each other context although still with the distance and with this, within this virtual uh, environment. Here you see an example, for instance, of a plenary session where we have all the students on one side and all the students on the other side communicating through uh, video conference tools, but also other uh, kinds of smaller team uh, approaches the, in order to mimic what would happen inside a real classroom. Also, be, because again, it's not only knowledge is also action, and it's also being that are fostered in this, in this context. And some of the students, for instance, in the uh, final assessment that we did, uh, very positively uh, assessed, most of them actually, the use of these virtual technologies in the collaboration. So learning about virtual, communicate, making uh, international and intercultural uh, experiences. This virtual environment, though, uh, as I was mentioning, was also complemented by a strong local engagement. So we have here this constant cycling through a local engagement and a sharing globally of what the experiences of what the research results were in the different contexts. And this allowed for a better understanding of and a better acquiring of certain kind of knowledge as well as to foster um, this sense of being an involvement and commitment towards the possible solutions of, uh, of uh, different problems. And this happened both on a more exploratory and experiential way with certain activities, but also really with an active engagement in, this, uh, in these different communities. Uh, which uh, also led uh, to, to uh, statements such as 
this, uh, I gain teamwork skills, but train my holistic view on issues, understand the problems, complexity, and thereby hurdles to a more sustainable way. So the, the more uh, motivational part of, uh, of the curriculum, which, uh, which also adds this more, much more uh, real component. So if the curriculum um, was uh, this, I told you about a little bit about the curriculum and about this environment, what are the implications somehow? I'm not a governance expert, uh, but what can, might be the implications for the kind of governance structure that we should think about putting in place if this is the kind of educational experience uh, that we want? And in the first place, we, def we need a wide variety of expertise. And it's not only disciplinary expertise, but it's also technical expertise, and it goes along the line of what Manfred was talking about of what kind of uh, people are needed in the university, not only for the research purposes, but also for offering this kind of educational experiences. What kind of relationships are supported by certain governance, uh, certain governance structures? and who has a say in the decisions that are made about the university. I was a little bit surprised today, I haven't heard anything about trying to involve the students in deciding what the university of the 21st century should be. And this is, for instance, one of the big lessons learned in this experiment of really conducting rigorously forms of formative assessment and co-design of the curriculum as a very important part of what this university uh, should look like. And of course, spaces. To, this morning, uh, the, the question was raised about the borders, about what, what are the borders between the university and non-university in this different context. And um, our experience does us that these borders need to be questioned, need to be questioned and and not in a negative way, saying the university is not anymore something, but definitely trying to see what these relationships uh, become within certain spaces that can be virtually mediated or uh, in different local contexts. And finally, also the people, not only the institution, but what are the people, the kind of people, the kind of personalities that are in this process. And uh, in, uh, uh, along these lines, important lessons for uh, and ideas about what these structures might be in the future will have to involve people relationship with places for teaching and learning in a way that allows for co-development of curricula for co-development of institutions aligning activities locations and technical equipment learning through the environment and the different contexts. so relationships in this case will become the one of the uh, one of the main issues this is uh, a little bit lesson learned. At this point, from the global classroom, we made it to create and to give rise to this different idea of a curriculum. Our impact already with the 70, 80 students, uh, or at least is to have, to have um, educated some uh, of the students that hopefully will make a difference in their, in their different fields. And above all, we are working now on scaling up the results from uh, what we got to a master's level, but as well producing a handbook, a resource book that uh, should be a how-to guide to how to conduct this kind of uh, collaborations or this kind of experiments in curriculum reform. Uh, and our vision, the vision, very uh, to sum it up, that we propose is really a, the idea of curricula that foster change agents in, as for their knowledges, mindsets, and skills, but that also allow for adaptable and flexible formats for teaching and learning that actually match the kind of world that we are dealing with by using tools and technologies and governance structure that at that point are really just tools and means for the education of uh, the next generation. Thanks to, uh, this was a highly collaborative project. Without, no, nobody would be able to, to, to perform such an experiment by himself, and above all this, or, or herself, above, above all the students and different levels from technicians to all possible people who have equally contributed to the successful implementation of this curriculum. Thank you for listening.
I didn't choose uh, the title for this, but then I uh, tried to, to uh, create a lecture or, or a presentation that fits the title, and let's see how, how, how that works. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what we do at Diversity, um, dive into a bit more detail as to you know how it actually works and what the didactics of online education uh, look like in the, in the courses that we do, because I think uh, that is, there's a lot of... Yeah, uh, um, yeah, confusion about what that actually means, e-learning, online education, there are all these terms, but uh, people have either no or very different ideas about uh, what that is or should be. And then at the end, uh, I want to give you a bit of an outlook um, as to what I think, what could be done using um, this kind of approach in uh, traditional universities and or how traditional universities might adopt and adapt uh, to, to these um, new technologies. To start out with, just a brief overview um, as to you know, what we're doing at Diversity. Diversity is an online education platform. Uh, the, uh, the platform was launched in October uh, of 2013. Since then, we've partnered up with over 100 institutions. Those are mostly universities, but also other institutions such as the European Union, United Nations, uh, the WWF, the World Wide Fund for Nature, um, but also companies, for example, KPMG. Um, and with these institutions, uh, we've developed courses that, we, uh, that we've put on our platform. And uh, we've over one million people have, in, or there have been one million enrollments. Seven hundred fifty thousand people have signed up for over a million courses in, in total. Um, and these courses are asynchronous, so it's it's not a virtual classroom where you know you have one teacher and thirty students, but they are uh, courses that are conceived in a sp specific way. And I'm I'm going to explain in more detail how that actually works. Um, that people can then um, take at their own pace. Yeah? So they're self-paced, asynchronous online courses. Um, the largest course had almost 100,000 enrollments. So these courses can get very, very big yeah? because uh, people work through the material, uh, but it's more than just material. And that's, that's something I'm going to talk to you about uh, some more. The, just to explain the model uh, um, again, because that's not self-evidence of what's our role, what's the partner's role, who does what. Uh, I, I brought this chart. So we always work with people that have expertise in a specific area. And the academic partners, instead of the universities, there can be corporate partners or other institutional <coughs> partners. And then there are courses that we create on their own label, but there we also work with external experts that have the subject matter expertise. Yeah, and then in this development stage, if you look at the capabilities, the, f the first step, our role is uh, to help with the instructional design and consult the, the, the subject matter experts how to create a good online course. Because, of course, there are lots of people with expertise out there um, in all sorts of domains, but how do you create an engaging online learning experience? A lot of people are a bit at a loss. Yeah? They say, okay, you know, I know a lot about astrophysics, but I don't know how to teach online. So that's where we come in and help them. Then the second step is delivery. You know, we built the platform where the course lives, you know. Uh, so um, we, we put it online. That's the second part uh, where we come in. And the third part is distribution. Um, that is, you know, actually getting the course to, to the users. And that can be individuals um, all around the world. I mean, our user base is very diverse. They're not people just enrolled at universities, but you know, my mom is taking courses on our platform on 
uh, history, for example. And we also have uh, um, organizations that we work with. So we sell these courses to, to large corporates. That's the B2B part of delivery. So that's the basic model. Diversity uh, is the platform, but it's not just the software. It's also, you know, how do you make a good online course and how do you get people to actually use it? So these are the three essential capabilities. How does this compare to, uh, you know, other forms of e-learning? I mean, that's something that I get a lot. People say, well, you know, e-learning has been around for 20 years or 30 years, whatever. People never really liked it. Why is it supposed to work this time? You know, why, why is this different? And the major difference in what we do and what other new solution providers in this space that, you know, have emerged in the last four years, I would say, uh, are doing is that we're moving, finally moving beyond content. Uh, the traditional e-learning was these kind of interactive PowerPoint slides, web-based trainings they were called. You had a, like a flash file and it looked like a presentation that you flipped through and then maybe you had a few multiple choice questions and that was it. And it was essentially like a textbook with a bit more interactivity. And we conceive of an online course as a process. Um, where it's not just about content, but it's also about assignments, making people do actual work, and uh, you know, and letting them um, interact with other people. So it's an active social process. Um, and there's this nice quote here, maybe some can't read it in the back. If high quality, re reusable content were all that were required to support learning, libraries would never have evolved into universities. That is to say, interaction with other human beings always has been and always will be an integral part of the learning process. This is especially true when learning higher, uh, higher order skills. And I would add, um, and uh, this, this is also true online, you know. Um, the interaction with the people is an integral part of the learning process, whether it's offline or online. So, you know, this, the, the image there of, you know, students sitting and, 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 and chatting with each other, uh, that I think it should be more what we're thinking of when we look for a metaphor for an online course that in the library. It's more the campus cafeteria than the library, you know, uh, where you sit by yourself. Um, and that is uh, sort of in the most schematic way, and I, I guess we have a similar <laughs> way of representing things here, that is uh, that you need to bring together three different things. Traditional e-learning was only the content part, you know. Here's the stuff read it, you know, and, and then you, you kind of have to learn it by yourself. But we also need the context. We need assignments that go beyond multiple choice, uh, where, you know, you might have to sit down for five hours and write a response paper or, you know, do, do some sort of research. Um, and you need the community, you need the feedback from other people that have engaged with the material in depth uh, to see, you know, how they view it and uh, where you come together and negotiate truth. Yeah? So it's... it's uh, we focus on what I call sort of grayscale learning, where it's not about right or wrong, yes or no, but more about I would do it this way because, or I think we should do it this way because. And uh, you know, a lot of academic study is like that. Also, a lot of professional learning is like that because. Um, in reality, there isn't typically a right or wrong answer. There are just different ways of doing it, doing things in context, and that's very much Yehuda. Uh, um, and then you can you can you know come together and, and, and talk about that. So this active engagement with assignments, the context part, applying your knowledge in different contexts, in case studies, for example, and you know engaging with others and debating with others. Uh, that's that's a key component of this kind of. Uh, course experience. So um, when we design courses, and as I said, they're asynchronous online learning experience, so they're designed, they're built, they're put on the platform, and then they sit there and people can work through it. So it's not live, it's not like one-on-one -on -one relationship with the teacher, but that doesn't mean that it has to be boring and isolated, uh, a boring and isolated experience. Um, and the way, reason we've designed it or we've, we've come up with this way of doing things is precisely the one that was mentioned earlier, scale. You know, if you design a course in this way, you can have a potentially infinite number of students. So how do we make it interesting, interactive, and social in spite of the fact that it's pre-produced and kind of a, a canned 
uh, experience. So the emotional part is it, there. It's all about storytelling. You know, like using storytelling techniques not to start like an academic normally would with a captive audience. Okay, um, you know, this is what I'm going to talk about. I have these 10 lectures. I'll start with the definitions. You know, people already fall asleep. So what we, the way we think about it is more that you, you have to you get people in the guts. So at the beginning of a course, the opening has to be something that makes it relevant to them. So we have this example right now. We talked to Deutsche Bahn. They have these um, trainings for um, people that work on the tracks, uh, security training to make sure that there are no accidents. Now you can of course run them through the rules of you know, how to operate the tracks so that there are no accidents, but that's rather boring. And the, there we you know the opening is, okay, you're the hero of this, of this story. You, know, you have to prevent the accident. Uh, you have a specific case, so this is gonna happen. Now it's your task to you know, know the rules well enough to prevent the accident from happening so there are no casualties. You know, it's a completely different approach in engaging people to, uh, to make them interested in what it is they're supposed to learn. Which brings us to the, the, the second part, which is called participatory pedagogy. Again, that's, what, that's the context bit. You have to give people exercises where they get to apply what they've learned in a specific context, in the context of a case study. I mean, the, there's a difference between the kind of online learning that we call sort of lean back online learning, you click play and then you watch, and the lean forward online learning, the kind of attitude that you see here with this kid that's like super engaged. That's the kind of attitude we'd like to see and that you can only get through challenging assignments. And there's a reason he's so engaged, and that's because there's someone else watching. And that's the third part, it's the social element. You know, one of the reasons that he's so keen to perform there is because there is someone else uh, that's watching and, and there's this competitive aspect to it. And that's the, that's the third part, the social interaction, that uh, in, in this kind of course, um, you want to tap into human motivations where that could be that could be competitiveness that could be altruism um, where uh, people either work together or work you know in a, in a competitive context um, against each other but th that you that always keep that in mind that uh, it's a key component of what makes people interested in, in actually engaging with material is that there are other people watching and either you know giving them a challenge or giving them praise uh, or feedback. So um, you could, for example, have a, a um, you could let people write essays and then you do a peer review exercise where they give each other feedback on what they've written um, and great things and then, but then you can use all the grades that came out of these peer reviews to order all the essays and see, you know, okay, which one was the best out of the entire group, which is also a good way, by the way, to identify quality and quantity. I mean, you can have 100,000 people in the course. If everyone has to peer review three essays, every essay in the course is graded. If you then look only at the essays that got, that got 10 out of 10 from three people, those essays will probably be very, very interesting. It would take a faculty member ages to read 100,000 essays, but if everyone does three, it's, it's relatively quick to do, and the, 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 you know, the top 10 out of 100,000 will most likely be very, very interesting. Um, then what I often hear is that there's, uh, people say, well, you know, this, this approach you know, it might work for, typically people think of it as, okay, yeah, it works for statistics, but it doesn't really work for topics that have sort of a human touch to it. Yeah? And uh, if you think about something like leadership, yeah, which would be a sort of a prime example of this, but there are plenty of others, um, they say, yeah, of course you can't teach that online, you know, that doesn't work. Well, I beg to differ because, um, I mean, the traditional e-learning course, what you'd have, if you think of something like e-learning, okay, uh, of, like leadership, I don't know, people, two people yell at each other in the hallway, and then it the stops the video, and then you get a multiple choice question, what do you do? I go there and I yell at them as well. I turn around and I walk away. Or I go there and uh, we have a reasonable conversation to uh, resolve the situation. So you take number three, you know, you go there and you resolve, resolve the situation. But of course, you, that doesn't teach you anything because you don't know how to resolve, resolve the situation. Now, the way I would imagine that kind of thing to go is that you say, okay, you have a video, people fighting in the hallway. The second thing then isn't the multiple choice question, okay, what do you do, one, two, three, but then your camera comes on and says, okay, 30 seconds, what exactly would you tell them? Record a video statement of yourself, 
how would you react to that situation? And then you can aggregate all these video responses into a stream where you see how all the different students react to that situation. And those reactions will be very different. You know, and, you know, um, and they'll, be, they'll differ whether students are young or old, or male or female, or whether they have work experience or they don't. And then students can go to these responses and give each other feedback and say, look, the way you phrased that there, that really got to me, or that really put me off and I wouldn't have listened. And, uh, and that way, you can engage with something that's very sort of human touch, uh, um, non-binary, you know, grayscale learning, um, in, a, in quite a deep way. And you, uh, by virtue of doing it this way, you create also a library of, of user-generated content that helps to illustrate in, um, in, in a very multifaceted way uh, how you give feedback right or wrong. And I think you also give students an opportunity to fail here. And that will be much more instructional than a professor standing up at the beginning and saying, these are the three golden rules of giving feedback. You know, please learn this by heart. You know, you, you won't learn it the same way as if you have to try it. You see how other people do it, and you get feedback on the way you did it. Yeah, so it's, I think you can engage much more in depth that way. So what we aspire to do is to create a learning experience that is as scalable as you know, the traditional e-learning uh, experience that is mostly about content delivery, you know, which in the digital, uh, in digital form means you know, it's infinitely scalable, but achieves the same kind of learning outcomes that we've traditionally only been able to achieve in the context of, of on-site training or classroom instruction. OK. I, was, I promised that I'd tie it back to the governance issue. Now, how can universities do these things? Because building something like this is kind of beyond the capacity of a traditional institution uh, you know, um, like this or, or, or most traditional universities because they're not software companies. It just, up to now, wasn't part of their mission to create a learning experience like that. And that's why they haven't done it. <laughs> And that's why they'll struggle to do it going forward. Now, who's out there enabling universities to do things like that? So that's the space, kind of how I see it right now. I mean, of course, you could add more companies, but I think it gives you a sort of a vague idea of where we, where we stand. Uh, differentiation here is non-profit, for-profit, and individual institutions and platform plays. And I think uh, all universities have to think about where do they see themselves with what kind of offering. You know, so. To you, for example, it's an American company. They went public, about a billion dollar in market capitalization. They work with some 15 universities right now, creating fully online master's degree programs for the universities. They, they run and operate these programs from admissions to teaching to graduation. Um, the only contribution of the university is the quality control, like the initial, the, 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 the expertise um, and the quality control uh, throughout, but um, all of the student services, for example, are run by the company. Um, professors, uh, you know, give seminars, but it's very um, high touch, high cost. So they use virtual classrooms, like seminars with 12 people uh, in online, live, but they also, every degree costs the exact same that it would cost on campus. So you, cost, you pay $100,000 for a degree. So that's, that's one model of doing it. Then you have the Coursera model, where a course costs $49. That's uh, the other end of the spectrum. That's probably the cheapest that's around right now. Um, and similar, uh, similar to edX, uh, so these platform models offer things uh, at much lower cost and at much larger scale. Um, and then there are a couple of non-profit institutional initiatives um, that uh, haven't achieved the kind of scale that Coursera and edX have achieved. But I mean, Western Governors, for example, is interesting. It's an initiative by the 19 Western Governors of Western, the Western United States. Um, it's uh, yeah, they have several tens of thousands of students and have branched out to more and more states now um, and have created some sort of franchise model, which is why I put them further to the right. They're not a platform, but uh, yeah, as I said, they're a franchise. Uh, I found a digital school, you know, that's one institution. 
the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon, that's one institution creating courses. So there are a number of models out there, and I think it would be interesting to uh, talk a long time about this, but uh, for, for universities to, to look into these different models and think about where do we see ourselves, with what kind of offering, you know? And um, then I brought one, uh, uh, a couple of slides, and then I'm done, um, thinking about this question of the 21st century curriculum and how could we uh, implement the kind of things that Yehuda and I are talking about in the book at scale. Because, I mean, that's, that's how we came to it. I mean, he said, you know, I think we need to do something about what we teach. And I said, okay, and I think we need to just do something about how we teach if we want to, you know, uh, uh, implement this at scale. So if we look at the traditional mode of instructions, um, every university, of course, only can offer a very limited scope of courses. Quality is quite inconsistent. Uh, you know, some people do a great job at teaching, others don't, but it's not what we recruit them for. So, you know, you, you don't, uh, you won't get great quality unless you, that's something that you place a priority on. Of course, you know, it's all only in a specific location. It's only synchronous. So, you know, a course only takes place when the instructor is in session. Uh, and, and if it is not offered this semester, too bad. And then, um, it being analog in and by itself, you could also see as a problem, given that a lot of the work in the real world is increasingly virtual in teams, um, if your institution doesn't offer anything digital, I would say you're kind of failing your students simply because a large share of what they'll do in the rest of their lives will be in digital. So, so I think uh, in, in principle, there is no normative quality to analog and digital, but I think not having anything digital is a problem because uh, it's just so far removed from, from uh, what they will be the reality that they work in. So this idea that, that we've come up with and talked to a number of institutions about, but uh, as Manfred said, they're notoriously bad at collaborating, uh, is one to, to form a, a digital education alliance. So to have, to bring together a number of institutions that recognize each other as peers, that maybe already have formed uh, um, institutional collaborations. And we've talked to SEMS, for example, this uh, alliance of, of business schools uh, in Europe, but a number of others. Um, where we thought, okay, they, it should be relatively straightforward for them to agree on a set of courses that they share uh, amongst each other. And if they were to do that, that, for example, each institution says, okay, we invest money in two or three courses and put them in a common pool, and you have 10 or 20 institutions doing that, suddenly you, know, you have a pool of dozens of really high quality courses that could be shared across institutional boundaries that would enable them to you know, widen the scope of their curriculum. I mean, if you look at large universities, a couple of dozen courses doesn't make that much of a difference, but if you look at small, smaller institutions, for example, business schools, I mean, I graduated from the Hertha School of Governance, we had like 10 electives. If we had 30 additional electives, that would mean we quadrupled the number of courses, yeah? So it's, uh, it's, that would be quite significant change, yeah? So that, uh, um, having more scope, you ha having more consistency in quality because I mean, if you produce something in an online format, it's much easier to monitor the quality and to continuously, iteratively improve it because, you know, people can nag over everything, little detail of it, and you can overhaul it from semester to semester so the courses get better and better. Um, you could offer them, of course, independence uh, from location and time. That's, that also means students could take them during the summer break or whenever they have, you know, uh, extra time. And, yeah, you would prepare them having a digital learning experience will prepare them for the, for the real world, if you will. Uh, in Germany, the technical universities are thinking about precisely this. The TU9, they want to do eight courses now, four with us and four with edX, um, to, for exactly these reasons, enabling students to take them across institutional boundaries and receive credit from all the partner institutions. Um, but yeah, we'd also be interested in expanding this model to other, to other institutions, as I said. So far, unfortunately, we've found them to be, yeah, uh, not so entrepreneurial about it, let's put it that way. Okay, that being said, uh, that's what I wanted to share for today, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.